We're ready for our final panel session of the first day of our Fest Schrift. Uh, this one is on my macroeconomic linkages, hedge funds, derivative markets, futures, and options. And the moderator is Professor Brian Wright. Uh, Brian is a professor of agricultural and resource economics here at Berkeley. His interests uh, in economic uncertainty and innovation date from early experiences on his family's sheep farm in New South Wales. He received a Bachelor of Agricultural Economics first class honors from the University of New England, Armydale, where he won a Frank Knox Fellowship to attend Harvard, where he received an AM and PhD in economics. Prior to joining the faculty at Berkeley, he taught at Yale in their economics department. His research interests include economics of markets for storable commodities, market stabilization, agricultural policy, industrial organization, public finance, invention incentives, intellectual property rights, the economics of research and development, and the economics of conservation and innovation of genetic resources. Brian. Okay. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. And uh, it's not necessarily a pleasure to be given the task of having everybody keep on time. But uh, um, I thought I'd go back and, before I make other remarks, say how I first met Gordon, and, uh, and even before that, how I first became aware of him. I was, uh, when I was at Harvard, I started working on some large-scale economic models with Dale Jorgensen. Uh, when I went to Yale, I started working on how to explain the simple economics behind the results from these large-scale models. And in the course of doing that, I uh, went to a conference, and I'm not quite sure what the conference was, but... Maybe that was it. Um, but anyway, <laughs> Gordon remembers everything. If you ever go to one of these conferences, behave yourself, because he remembers everything forever. <laughs> and, but anyway, I was sitting pretty much down the back, and he was sitting next to Richard Just on, on the right-hand side of the center aisle. And they came in, and they looked so confident in what they were doing and so focused. And what they were doing, presenting was a comparison of futures markets as forecasts with the results of several large-scale models, including the Chase Econometrics model, the Wharton model, and the DRI model, which I'd worked with a lot at Harvard with Marty Feldstein and with um, Jorgensen. And uh, their paper showed, and I think it was later published in the American Journal of Agricultural Economics, I, I think that's right. Anyway, it showed that the futures market did about as well, if not better, than the other markets. Uh, maybe it had a, a little more variance, but better accuracy. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of the end of the market for the work of those models in price forecasting. Now, that's the good part. Gordon didn't really get totally convinced with the message of this work, because then he did another paper with Colin Carter on pricing in the soybean complex, where he was a bit more wishy-washy. He said, well, for some of these products in the soybean complex, it looks like the models may do a little better. Um, Jeff Williams and I then uh, looked at this again uh, using simulations from a, a rational ex expectations model where you recognize the role of storage and found out that their critical regions were all wrong. So they're actually reproving what Gordon had done in the first model. He should have stuck with that. But, that but the first model that worked really was the beginning of the end of believing these complicated large scale models uh, over things like uh, markets from commodity exchanges. And I think that was very important work. And I was quite impressed with it, but I didn't get to know him at that time. Uh, about that time, I got an overture from Stanford to go to the Food Research Institute. And I didn't pick that up because I wasn't that interested. I wanted to learn more. But then I went to another conference about three years later, and I met Gordon in the men's room. And he said, would you be interested in coming to Berkeley? And I said, yeah, well, maybe. And, uh, that was maybe my first real conversation with him uh, in life. He didn't really know me at all. But that was the start of a wonderful period where he was chair there, in the, and uh, he was setting the department on the right road, uh, a department that had been in a certain amount of mess. And then after that, after he got the department straightened out, he took the college, which was totally directionless and very contentious between different departments, and put that on the right road. A very difficult job. He had to fire people. It wasn't fun, but it was a tremendous achievement. And then he 
used this experience to inform his work on public-private partnerships, which I think is very insightful. One defect in that work, I think, is that he assumes that the people negotiating these partnerships have the same qualities that he has and the same integrity he has with respect to the university. Uh, he maybe overestimates the average person's uh, ability in these areas and also maybe their ability to work 40 hours in a 24-hour day. Um, but uh, one thing that I can say about Gordon is there's nobody in this room who loves the UC system more than he does. And everything to do with quality and academic rigor and excellence of talent is what he's interested in. And that's about all he's interested in, the mission of the university, of the college and the department. Uh, now, I, don't want to, I, I have a difficult task here keeping everybody else on time, so I'm, not try, I'm going to try and not go over. And so now I'll introduce the next person. We'll go by the program, not by the seating order. So Vito Palmieri will be uh, next. And he's co-founder of EASI, or EC, I guess. And I'd like him to... Well, <clears throat> hello, people. My, my talk today is going to be a, a lot different from the people who told, told you about all this great research and academic excellence and awards that are won, because I, I didn't work with Gordon in any of that. My work with him is, I don't know if you know, but Gordon has had four careers simultaneously. He's the hardest working person I've seen in academia and beyond. We've all heard today about all the papers he does and obviously all the help he's given to students and pushing ideas ahead. We also have touched on some of the work he's done as a consultant, but few people know that he's been a hedge fund manager and uh, he's been uh, consulting or have helping develop young companies and has been the chairman of several companies. So I'm kind of working on the third and fourth. But um, just to give an introduction that how I found to how I met Gordon is he was my what they call managerial economics professor at Harvard Business School. Now Harvard Business School is kind of a little different academic um, environment than most places and everything is a teach is the uh, um, case method. So everything is done through kind of a Socratic method which is a lot of fun for the students. They have a business case, a problem to solve, and then they go at it and they solve it. And as they go and at it and solve it, they found out how bad they were and they learn to become better. So it's, it actually works very well. We, however, had Gordon for really a mathematical statistical course in, um, in managerial economics and decision theory, basically. And it's very hard to teach that in the case method. You know, they give you a little papers, you, you learn a little bit about the R squared or whatever, and you, you try to, you know, you kind of pick this up, and it was up to the guy who was teaching you to, you know, actually have you understand what this stuff is about, but the method was Socratic, so you're supposed to kind of pull from it within this chi statistic, which most people didn't even know how to pronounce, you know? So, uh, but, the thing that was really great was that Gordon really was a great teacher. I mean, he was incredible. He was only about 32 then. We were probably 25. He was young and energetic, and he used to, we were all in amphitheaters of 80 people. And he'd run up and down the amphitheater and yell out, well, suppose this happens. And then we were saying, I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was kind of a blur. But the truth was that Gordon was so good in those days you really picked stuff up. He would, he would knew how to throw out the little bits of information, which sometimes are wrong so that you, you, know, you would challenge him on it, and you would actually learn how to make decisions. And I gotta say that throughout my business career, I never was in academics after that, that it really worked. You know, I, I was with uh, one company, and they were deciding on how much money they should put into a new area of business. And I remember I was standing up there, and I was actually the computer guy, and I was doing a little model and analyzing, you know, if you put this much money in, you'll probably get that much if this many people bought the product. And the bottom line was that, according, Gordon Moore with a, good name, a fellow named Howard Rafel, who was a famous economist at the time, and he came up with a thing called a decision tree. And I, we created a little decision tree, and, from the decision tree, we decided they were going to put a lot of money into this area. 
Well, 20 years later, they sold the company for $73 billion. And I always think that Gordon was there a little bit, you know, about doing some real analytical work instead of just sitting and pulling a number out of your ass, you know. <laughs> Which is the way a lot of business works. Okay. Now, the one fun thing, and I, I promised I would keep this story short because I, Gordon isn't particularly, you know, proud of this story. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we would, we would spend about, they gave us these cases, you had three cases a night, and you spent about an hour, an hour and a half. That's all the time you had, you know, to prepare these cases. And, you know, they were pretty hard, you know, trying to figure out, especially these <laughs> mathematical concepts, how this guy was going to apply it to business. You had no, absolutely no idea when you started the case. But you read this case, and it became obvious what they were trying to tell you is there's a lot more to statistics than the R squared. You know, that was kind of the bottom line. So I figured, well, I, I've got enough to go on, you know. And then they gave you some examples. And I started to do the example. I said, wow, there's a lot of math in all this. I won't get to sleep tonight if I do this story stuff. They can't expect us to press all these problems. So anyway, then go into class the next day, and Gordon, you know, he supposes the first, first a few things. And he said, well, what is the best answer? And I said, Gordon, number two, because it has the higher, highest R squared which I knew was the wrong answer, but I felt that that would get, you know, discussion going. And Gordon, and Gordon looks at me and he says, Mr. Palmieri, you're wrong. And I went, Professor Rouser, prove it. <laughs> and Gordon takes up a piece of chalk, and we had, I think it was seven chalkboards in the front of the room, which are rarely used. But he started to actually solve this problem mathematically, which I knew was very complicated. So all I kept hoping is that he would go beyond the hour and a half class and not get, <laughs> not get back to me. So he's there, and he's writing integrals on the board. You know, I'm trying to you know, remember from cal calculus how all this worked. And so I'm following, but I was able to follow pretty well. And he kept moving. And I kept going, oh shit, he's gonna come back to me and said, you're wrong, do I just admit it or do I say something funny or do I ask him? The best thing is always to ask him another question because then, he, <laughs> then he'd go back to the board and prove that one too. So anyway, he kept, he kept on going really fast and he, he was going like a long time, which was like four minutes or something, trying to solve this. And then at one point he stops and he looks back at all his calculations and I go, aha, he found, he found something wrong. And the trouble was is that what this case was about, it's a look at the chi statistic as well as the R squared. That'll, give you, that'll help you solve the problem properly. Well, the truth was that was true, but it also was the example that had the highest R squared. So I immediately said, it's time to seize victory. And I jumped up on the desk. I went, up the R squared, to which my classmates, given the fact that they, if they were in the same situation, they don't know what the hell they do, they cheered me on greatly. <laughs> But the best thing was, and this is the thing, is that Gordon laughed. And it's, you know, that was, that really kind of changed all the students' view of him because he always was on our side. And whatever it took for you to get educated, he was willing to go there, even though it might be a little bit circuitous to him, to, you, to him but it was a way for him for you to learn. And that's, that's really what Gordon's magic it was is that he really was one of us. And it, it just was, a, it was an amazing thing. To make this, to underscore this, Gordon was the only professor in the history of Harvard Business School to get a straight five in the ranking, rankings from his students, which got him the Harvard Excellence in Teaching Award, and also two skits from his classes. Skits were the kind of the highest honor a class could give to uh, a, stu uh, a, a teacher. And one of the skits was written by a guy who eventually went, went to be Jay Leno's and David Letterman's chief writer. So, you know, he, Gordon inspired him too, into different directions. Uh, so anyway, so the, the, te the teaching days were at Harvard really were uh, um, a wonderful time to meet Gordon and to see all the things that, you know, that I would no normally not learn. But given the way Gordon was such a great teacher, as one of the women who became a, a, a romance writer, she went to Harvard Business School and ended up writing Harlequin romances. It was very successful. She said, I was never really f afraid of math you know, after, the, after his class. I knew that if Gordon did it, it must be right. <laughs> so anyway, so that was, that's the one little thing I was going to put on the side, but the, Gordon's teaching. The, other, the thing, of course, I've been most involved with with Gordon is um, um, 
Yeah, a few minutes. Uh, is uh, the um, uh, trading, you know, Gordon's trading program, which was a third of his fourth third of his fourth jobs, and he's done that forty for forty years. It's always been a side thing. I, I know he doesn't like this, but I always called it his hobby, you know. And many people would be very, very happy and would live on a great retirement if they only had his skill and his hobby. Uh, but the thing about it was, as you might know, Gordon was a Golden Gloves boxing champ as a teenager. And also, he was, had, was a full, one of the youngest full professors at the University of uh, Davis. He told me he wasn't absolutely the youngest, but by 24 he was. And by 30, he had appointments with the statistical uh, people at uh, Iowa State, which was at that point one of the leading uh, math statistics uh, uh, universities, university in, in Harvard. Uh, by the you know by the time he was 30, that was pretty good. So that's pre pre us. So the one thing that I the, the best thing that ever happened to me with Gord is I went into his class, and most people went you know they want to understand something about mathematics. But it turned out that a lot of people in his class went for a life you know uh, life understanding. He was our youngest professor, so he could understand some of the things that we were going through. So I went in and I said, Gordon, how do we make a lot of money? And uh, Gordon, Gordon smiled and he, I came out to here to California and while he was building his academic profession, we were building the hedge fund. And uh, basically, a hedge fund is any non-standard pool of money. You know, you could go and get a regular fund, Magellan, and, but he, he would do things that were a little different. Oh, thank thanks, you. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think I knew most of that, but I didn't know that the way he taught at Harvard inspired a lot of jokes on Jay Leno, but that's, uh, yeah. that's something else. Uh, now, next we'll have Bill Borson, and uh, he'll talk from the same side of, 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 of Gordon's life, and I'd uh, like so to hear what he has one, to say. One theme that, that uh, runs through all of the stories that, that you'll hear on this panel and the previous ones that I've listened to are Gordon's command of the details of the projects that he's involved in at the same time that he retains a high-level strategic vision. And I was first introduced to Gordon when we were both working at consulting companies. He was at LECG, I was at Strategic Decisions Group. At the time, he founded a company called Opt4 Derivatives uh, that developed some trading technology that he and I have gone on to demonstrate has some real-world applications in today's economy for systemic risk. And I'll explain a little bit about the details and how it can uh, be applied at the systemic risk level. Uh, first, I'd like to mention there's a typo in um, the agenda. Um, I was not the chief financial officer. Laura Kraft was. I was the chief risk officer. So uh, they brought me on uh, after they had founded the company, uh, brilliantly thinking that the new concept then of value at risk could have some application in a uh, matching uh, trading venue uh, for structured contracts. So a structured contract, very common business to business type of uh, trading, where you have a single contract that embodies a number of elements, could be forward elements in agriculture, chemi uh, chemicals, and so forth. It could also embody uh, derivatives or optional elements. So these uh, contracts can be quite uh, involved. And as we saw in the financial crisis, they can pose very large risks to companies, but also to the economy as a whole if those risks uh, build up. So Opt4 developed what uh, we call a real-time, pre-trade, uh, risk-based transaction permissioning system. So let me break that down for you. Real-time meant we were able to do over a million transactions per second, and this is before the technology of graphic accelerator cards that uh, expands that by uh, six to 10 orders of magnitude in terms of rapidity. Uh, Risk-based means that we used value at risk, which is an analytic risk-based methodology, to measure the risk for each counterparty uh, as they're doing their trading. And if you think about a, a counterparty doing some trading, either on a standard futures contract or a very complex structured contract, they have both the risk of the contract itself and they have the risk that's mitigated by their offsetting collateral or 
uh, other contracts. And so we wanted to take both of those factors into account. Pre-trade <laughs> meant that we did all of these calculations on a risk-based basis before a contract was executed. And that's a lot different than the way the system works even today. Uh, so even today in, in CME or ICE, uh, they use a double-sided auction methodology. So contracts are executed, and then behind the scenes there's a risk analytic process. And their theory is they don't want to delay the execution of the contracts and then uh, you know, uh, have to uh, possibly unwind them. So our system was intended to do the collateral and credit checking before the contract was executed. And that meant, of course, you had to do all of this sub-second. And people said we couldn't do it. So we had a, a key technology that we uh, used, which was uh, to use the analytic uh, delta gamma value at risk uh, function as an interpolating function. Well, normally when you read uh, the VAR textbooks, they'll present several different methodologies. You've got historic, you've got analytic, uh, you've got Monte Carlo simulation methods. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to have the accuracy of a simulation method, but the speed and rapidity of calculation of the analytic method. And so we used the analytic VAR not as a uh, per se uh, model by itself, but to use it uh, as an interpolation model that would be periodically trued up to the more accurate uh, simulation model. And so it was capable of being fast, but also accurate on a several hour to overnight uh, basis. Um, the um, design was uh, at Opt4, uh, but it was actually implemented um, by the Board of Trade Clearing Corporation, which has subsequently, a few years back, been acquired by ICE. Um, and we chose them as their counterparty uh, for this uh, partnership between Op4 and Botsy, uh, particularly because they had the expertise in the classic way of doing clearing. They knew how to do it well. They were the world's leader in doing it. And so we wanted them to take our, our model of value at risk and implement it. And that's what happened. So without any more details about Opt4, let me flash forward to 2012 because we had the financial crisis in the rearview mirror at that point, but congressional investigations produced the book or the portfolio of AIG financial products, which owned all the derivatives that caused the $30 billion loss at AIG and the subsequent restructuring. Turns out that AIG was $9 billion underwater before the very first collateral call was made. Well, if you and I are uh, doing futures trading, how quick are they going to wait? You're underwater. They're going to be on you by 8 a.m. the next morning if they don't have somebody at your front door at 8 p.m. the night before, right? But uh, that didn't happen then. It still doesn't happen that way. So we looked at the transactional uh, uh, portfolio of AIG FP as it existed, and then we proposed a conjectural modeling uh, margining system, and we wound the clock back to about 2003, and then we wound it forward month by month through the end of 2008. And lo and behold, we found that if you had a very reasonable value at risk based margining system, collateral calls would have started in early 2007. Now, remember, in late 2008, the CEO of AIG FP gave congressional testimony that these contracts had zero financial risk, zero. But our winding it back and then forward, we saw that by about March of 2007, uh, half a billion to a billion dollar collateral call would have been made. That would have riveted the board of directors attention. They got the CEO of a division saying there's no risk, and they get a collateral call, it'd be like your wife reading your margin call in the morning, saying, what do you mean there's no risk on this trading book? So it highlights that these big systemic problems can be solved by the right kind of data, the right kind of technology, uh, but uh, we have to uh, move forward and implement it. And I will uh, make a side comment about that, which is if you actually look back at the crisis period from 06, 07, 08, uh, the two companies that went under, Lehman and AIG, were the two that did not start hedging in December of 06 
through about March of uh, 07. They didn't hedge their books, uh, and they're the ones that went under. Thanks very much. It's, it's very now we'll go, go back to the academic side. Colin Carter, distinguished professor from a pretty good agricultural economics department at UC Davis. Thank you, Brian. Are you staying, Gordon, or leaving? Yeah, I'm staying. Oh, OK. <laughs> Uh, I got the feeling when it was my turn you were going to leave. Anyway, um, congratulations, Gordon. Uh, like many people here, I'm indebted to Gordon. He was on my uh, PhD dissertation. Uh, there were three members, and I think Gordon's the only one who ever read it and gave me comments, so thank you so mm -hmm. much. <laughs> and uh, he taught me a lot about futures markets. So I got the email that said three to five minutes, Brian. So uh, it's my Canadian roots. So I'm going to stick to three to five. So I want to recognize a paper uh, published in the Journal of Finance in 1975 by Gordon and Tom Cargill. And uh, I think Tom was a student at Davis, right? You were probably his, his advisor. And this paper is called Temporal Price Behavior in Commodity Futures Markets. So this paper was written 45 years ago. And I actually read it a couple days ago. And it was so interesting because they talked about using the computer to do this, the computer to do that. In those days, it wasn't that common what they were doing. But um, I would argue that this paper uh, actually anticipated the financialization of commodity futures. Uh, they argued that the futures will be attracting a lot more attention by the industry. There will be new uh, products developed, new investors, and so on. Well, guess what? They were absolutely right. This was 1975. Subsequent to that, there was a, a huge expansion of uh, futures trading into financials and energies. Uh, and then, in addition, in the last 15 years, there's been this financialization. And what that means is there's been this incredible, incredible inflow of outside managed money into commodity futures, looking for a so-called new asset class. Now, the, the industry attracted this money because, as Gordon anticipated, the markets give investors exposure to a broad class of assets, uh, including equity indexes, interest rates, currencies, metals, agricultural, and energy commodities. And around the time that they wrote this paper, the amount of money uh, in futures markets under management was just north of $200 million. It's not a lot of money. And today, it's 360 billion. So it went from 200 million to 360. That's a 1,200-fold increase. And today, uh, index speculators are the largest participants in the futures industry. And these are largely pension and, and hedge funds, the type Vito was talking about. Now, you go back to their paper, and Cargill and Rouser studied the statistical properties of futures markets in a very sophisticated way uh, back in 1975. And they actually found that futures prices could be forecast with some systematic trading filters. So it was pretty innovative. Now, coincidentally, last month there was an article in the Financial Times. And it talked about this college dropout. And Gordon's helped a lot of people in college, but I guess he's also helped, helped college dropouts. This guy's name is uh, Mike Adam, and Mike uh, was in the UK, and his dad happened to be a sugar trader. And uh, Mike dropped out of college, and his dad was upset, so we put him to work uh, drawing charts of sugar futures prices, literally drawing charts by hand. And uh, he got sick of that, and um, he started uh, talking to a couple of his mates, and they said, you know, we can probably do this with a computer. Um, and this was after Gordon's paper, right? So they got the idea that they should uh, design futures trading systems on a computer following trend, following methods, which is exactly what, what Gordon did. Um, and they started a firm called AHL. And today, they control $30 billion in assets. And one of the three left the company, Mr. Harding, and his fund that he runs controls $20 billion today. Not bad. He's uh, probably the wealthiest man in the UK. So having read that, I thought, you know what? I, I wouldn't be surprised if back in that sugar uh, 
firm, back in the back rooms of that sugar firm, when um, you know, Mike's dad told him, well, you go to work and start drawing these charts, that somehow these guys, because one of his friends was an academic, they ran across Gordon's paper. You could just imagine in those days, this college dropout trying to figure out Gordon's uh, paper. But you could just imagine there'd be a lot of notes in the margin, a lot of things were underlined when they designed these computer trading systems. And um, I know one of them's a billionaire today, probably all three are. So Gordon, I hate to state the obvious, but there's one instance where you should have kept the research to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> or, or at least given it to Vito. <laughs> well, very, very nice. I'm glad you didn't say that if he stayed in college, probably would never have done any of this. <laughs> Okay, next is Alan Love from Washington State University where he's the director of the School of Economic Sciences. So I, I have a quick uh, correction as well. I was director of a uh, School of Economic oh, so Sciences, Jill. now Jill is, and uh, she's we're very happy that that transition's happened. But I, I wanna say I first became aware of Gordon uh, one day in my office uh, in Lexington, Massachusetts. I was uh, sitting there and I just uh, happened to lift up an article in the AJAE and it said, commodity price forecasting with large scale econometric models and the future uh, futures market. And that's where I was working. I was at DRI. And I started reading through. I didn't know anything about Richard Just and Gordon Rouser. But as I read through, it became clear that they liked futures markets really well. Uh, and that uh, I was uh, kind of a little dis disappointed in that. But then I kept reading. and. We were particularly good at corn, and that was one of the things I forecast. We beat the futures market in corn. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, Gordon, or not. But then I got disappointed again, because I saw, oh gosh, these forecasts were between 76 and 78, and that was before I joined the company. So I thought, <laughs> okay, fine. But, but it is disappointing that I didn't do those great uh, corn forecasts myself. Um, but anyway, it was fun. So, I got sort of ready to change career and go back and do a PhD. And I applied to a bunch of schools. One of them was because of this article. I applied at Berkeley. I also applied at, at Yale. And kind of coming back full circle here. I met you. Yeah, I yeah. first met Brian. I was traveling around with DRI a fair amount. And so I, uh, I went to see uh, Yale. I applied there. I saw Brian, this guy Brian. Brian says, you know, you, you don't want to go to, Ber uh, to Yale. You, you want to go to Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I thought, wow, <laughs> okay, here's a school I don't need to worry about getting into anymore. <laughs> because I went to see the guy I was going to work with, and he says, go to Berkeley. And then I went out to Berkeley, and I met Gordon, and I was supposed to talk with Gordon about a half hour. My to-be parents-in-law were in, in San Francisco, and they said, we'll just take you over and wait for you. It would just be a short trip. And I think we ended up talking, Gordon, about three hours that day. <laughs> Uh, turned out he was trading, and I had no idea about that. I was trading a tiny, tiny bit, and it was model-based stuff. And I, I'd say Gordon had an infectious enthusiasm. And it was really clear when I left that I wanted to go to Berkeley, and I hoped I could get in and work with Gordon. And, and that did work out. So I want to thank, thank you for that very much. So kind of moving on, um, one of the very first things I got involved with there was a paper with Gordon Rouser and other authors uh, who can't, aren't, aren't here today. And it was a paper that ended up winning the Quality of Research Discovery Award. And I wanted to call, talk about that just a bit. And it's, it's about the ag macro linkages that uh, Gordon's part of, a big part of his work has dealt with. And it doesn't come as a surprise to anybody. Um, agriculture is a highly capital intensive industry, which means that it's uh, closely related to interest rates, inflation, and it's a very trade dependent area as well. So exchange rates play a key role. And on the other side of the equation, um, ag prices tend to be very volatile, move around a lot, so they contribute to inflation, inflationary conditions. All of that became really obvious at the early stages of 1980s because we'd switched from a regime of effectively easy money, high inflation, uh, uh, high uh, um, unemployment, uh, low exchange rates, or I should say a, a dollar that was very weak, and uh, very high um, uh, inflation rates. So, and low interest rates, which had benefited agriculture. If you looked at it, it was like a subsidy to agriculture at that time. And in 19, early 1980s, the Federal Reserve changed to a kind of a Milton Friedman type recommendation of a, a fixed money supply coming in. 
and it put the brakes on everything. So what happened was uh, interest rates went uh, very high. Uh, U.S. exchange rate got very strong. Uh, uh, inflation uh, weakened dr dramatically, and it was like a tax on agriculture, uh, in effect, because of the export dependence and capital intensity of the industry. So in that work, we, Gordon's team, and it was a, it was a big team of people, built a, a, a big model, almost like the DRI model, uh, frankly. It was, a, it was a quite sizable one. It had a macro sector, it had uh, corn, wheat, uh, and it had uh, livestock, three different categories of livestock in it. Uh, and we worked on that model pretty intensely for a couple years, I guess. But we were able to run simulations mimicking this period of taxation, this period of subsidization, uh, and sort of see what happened. And there was a, a lot of discussion at that time from Jeff Frankel, also here at Berkeley, about overshooting models. And we were able to, uh, in that work, um, see how these macroeconomic linkages were really working. And it turned out that it was kind of got a surprising result. There was overshooting, and farmers were benefiting quite tremendously during the periods of subsidization, like the 70s. The prices went up, they captured the rents, uh, farm incomes increased, and so on. But the surprise was on the taxation period. And the taxation period, what was happening was government subsidies were effectively overshooting. Farm incomes actually weren't that much lower because of the subsidization from, of agriculture from the depressed prices. But government budgetary expenditures went up quite dramatically. And so I think that, that work was pretty insightful, and I, I think as well it probably contributed to a lot of work that Gordon did afterwards and before on political economy. Because what's very clear from, from I think, that research, and I read it just recently again, uh, is that you can't really understand long-term events in agriculture or make forecasts out a long period of time without really understanding the political economy. Because uh, agriculture is still an area that's uh, Governments consider high, high risk, that you need to provide a, a food supply that's going to be reliable. Um, black swan events, those sorts of things come along, and there's still going to be need for some sort of agricultural interventions. Another thing that came out of it as well, and, and for, for years and taking classes with Gordon, uh, he had recommended, uh, in effect, moving from a system of very uh, intricate and detailed uh, institutional settings where we had target prices, deficiency payments, support payments, uh, acreage diversions. It was a really complex and laden with uh, dead weight loss sort of uh, regulatory policy that was subsidizing it and moved into, uh, in effect, the missing market. The real reason that the farm problem was around was due to risk that couldn't be hedged because of uh, issues with uh, moral hazard and adverse selection and so on, that the government and subsequent ag policies have really moved much more toward uh, these insurance markets and government subsidized insurance markets. And I think Gordon's uh, policy work had a lot to do with that as well. So it had a big impact. So I want to say I'm still learning from Gordon. Uh, it's hard to miss his enthusiasm, and it is infectious. And uh, thank you for, for all of that. Now, finally, uh, we'll have Vito Palmieri, who's worked with Gordon on the other side of his activities again. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Gordon, excuse me, Gordon, excuse Gordon me. Maloney. Um, Gordon Filoni, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay, well, I'm tremendously academically underqualified based on this group. But what I will say is, in a weird, small world way, my dad was a PhD in mathematics and taught for 35 years at University of Connecticut and ended up doing his sabbatical with Bob Schiller in the mid-90s as he was putting together the research for rational exuberance. So it's an interesting small world here that connects us all uh, from an economics perspective. But I'm also in a different position in that I represent uh, Christmas future in a Charles Dickens sense for uh, Gordon Rouser in that um, we, uh, we started a company two years ago um, with another partner. Um, and I'm very, very excited to have him as a partner and I'm going to use all of the things that he's obviously been lauded for here today in helping us make that company as successful as we can. But what I wanted to say specifically was we started, I, I met Gordon 10 years ago when we started assessing and investing in uh, venture capital co companies uh, and in some cases funds. But back to Vito's point, 
he's been a mentor, not just to people, students, and academics, but to entrepreneurs and founders um, along the way over the last 20 plus years in a way that many people may not understand. But it was that enthusiasm for investing in those companies that brought us together. And now, 10 years later, we've decided to start a company around that process. So in short, OPAC Capital Partners, which is the name of our small company, um, goes and invests, uh, looks to invest in what we'll call milestone financing. So that's a phrase Gordon and I have come up with, in that the venture capital ecosystem has some inefficiencies we've found. And one of those is, that in between rounds of financing, companies tend to get short on cash. And as they get short on cash, they find that an injection of a small amount of capital can allow them to achieve a milestone that can dramatically impact valuation at the next round of funding. So we found that little niche and carved it out now. And through relationships that we've, all the three of us have built in the venture capital community, see a tremendous amount of deal flow. We've married that with something that came out of the 0809 crisis. On the individual, on the high net worth individual and family office um, side of, of investing, there was a tremendous amount of money that flowed into fund of funds to access venture capital. Those fund of funds created a layered fee structure that you were paying a lot to get access to these funds of funds. And what 08 and 09 showed you is that when things went really bad, you weren't really protecting yourself at all. And you lost every bit as much as if you'd made individual investments. So this started a renaissance back to family office investors, ultra high net worth individual investors wanting to do the work to invest directly in companies. And that's what we began to leverage off, which formed what's now OPAC. So we're really excited about the prospects of the business. We think it fits a really unique niche. We think we have a unique sort of deal flow process to generate ideas. And we think we're helping the family office world get access in a way that they haven't had access before. That all being said, I would say that, um, and it's hard for me because there's two Gordons here, so I immediately said I'm gonna have to use something other than Gordon. And since my dad was a PhD, um, Gordon's been Dr. Rouser to me from the day I met him, and he continues to be Dr. Rouser. So Dr. Rouser, thank you very much for having me here. And more importantly, thank you for being just a, a, a terrific mentor and partner. But one of the things that all of you know about Dr. Rouser is he will be incredibly straightforward with feedback. Um, so um, he's been very straightforward with feedback for me. And one of the things is he's continued to coach me on being a better listener. So to that point, I listened today, doctor. And in listening today, I can tell you I now understand why you become such a good partner for our business and why you will continue to be. So I just want to throw a couple sound bites at people. Um, hyperbole and narrative control, OK? Hyperbole and narrative control is very important in our business because every time a founder sits in front of you, he's guessing about everything he's telling you. So <laughs> he's going to be wildly optimistic about how good his product is, how much people are going to buy, and how quickly he's going to sell all this product. And that narrative needs to be controlled. <laughs> and so when the doctor and I sit in front of, uh, of founders, um, I found that he's been, uh, now I know, since he's joined research in the area, why he's been so good at uh, seeing through that hyperbole and narrative control. The second thing I wrote down was the sausage factory of policy formation. Well, I can tell you that uh, uh, there's the, the famous quote about the two things you never want to watch made are laws and sausages. I would throw venture capital right in there because <laughs> Anyone who's ever been involved in the, the process of taking a company from an idea to a business, it's hard to, to really articulate the pain that's involved in that. So his experience in policy formation, I think, sets a wonderful foundation for the pain and suffering we go through with a lot of these investment opportunities. Um, the other thing is uh, ecosystem inefficiencies. I think as we looked at the venture capital ecosystem to find the right fit for OPAC, it was this sort of concept and his ability to, to, to see this that allowed us to say, hey, there is a spot for us to be able to fill, which is where the larger venture capital firms don't want to do the smaller investments, two to six million, let's call it. It's very rare that they would want to do that small because they look at investment on ownership. They want a certain ownership percentage. That's how they view their portfolio. We don't have to view it that way because we're, we're servicing our clientele, which is simply providing access. We're not as worried. We're not running a fund. So there was this opportunity for us to fit our model into that in-between stage 
process for a company and really add value in creating the ability for them to hit significant milestones. So again, the inefficiencies of the ecosystem were something that he studied and became very clear, came to roost for us as well. The last thing and probably the most important is um, what I'll call uh, performance under pressure. Um, I have found over the years that there is no person I would rather have next to me when things go bad. It simply is what he excels in. The calmness under pressure, the ability to take and analyze a situation where emotions are very high, um, failure is imminent, and to sort of strategize around a solution has been truly a revelation for me and uh, a wonderful learning experience. But I, I tie that back to the fact that there was probably a lot of pressure too when communism fell and he had to figure out how to transition the world economic landscape. That seems like a lot of pressure. So to have a company start to implode probably isn't all that big a deal. So for all of these reasons, doctor, I did listen and I do understand now more than ever why it's been such a joy working with you and I continue to look forward to many years of that going forward. So thank you very much. I think you've proved you take notes better than most of our students. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, now we've got time because everybody kept pretty much within time for about 12 minutes of questions. Any questions from? Anybody in the audience? I think exhaustion has settled yeah, in. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's the clarity of our presentation? Yeah, 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 <laughs> the curse yeah, of the yeah, last yeah, panel. Yeah. <laughs> I've got one comment, which is the kind of experience you have when a company is failing. I think a lot of students would say that's the kind of experience they have the night before their oral exam in the ARE. <laughs> <laughs> you need to have that kind of stability and confidence to, to go through it. Um, anything else? Anybody else? If not, we can finish early and. Oh, there is one. David. Okay. There are so many people that speak about uh, future markets. Uh, the, head of the, the previous head of the Federal Reserve several uh, times suggested that iFinance is uh, basically taking is, uh, to some extent a transfer of resources from the poor to the rich. If you can make a case for people that care about political economy, why would, should, should we really support future market and how do they perform to, for society? What is your assessment or on the balance? How did it do? Okay, I'll, I'll take a crack at that, David. Um, I think given the fact that there's been this explosive growth in you know, the number of products offered on futures markets, and I mentioned some of them, uh, equity indexes, uh, energy contracts, uh, has meant that the industry, broadly defined, is much in a much better position to manage risk. You just think about the airlines, for instance. Now just, that's one example. About 30% of their operating costs are fuel. And you have the price of oil going from $40 to 140 back to 30. Uh, most airlines, also have huge exchange rate risk. You know, British Airlines earns revenue in British pounds, but they buy fuel in dollars. So that uh, market, whether people are trading directly or indirectly through uh, swap dealers, offers them the opportunity to manage their risk, and then they pass that on to you as a consumer because your, your flights are cheaper. That's just one example. So um, I think the markets have, uh, offered tremendous benefit to risk management, to price discovery. Uh, you know, a farmer in India, a farmer in China, knows what his cotton is worth because he has a cell phone now and he can check the price of cotton uh, on the New York exchange. And that's of tremendous value to that individual as well. They can't be taken advantage of because they know what their product is worth. I think I have another answer here. Well, I just wanted to make a, a cautionary note that unbridled and unregulated, those same markets can be subject to what Enron did in 2000, 2001, uh, where prices were deliberately, purposefully manipulated over an extended period of time. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> I, I would make one other comment, which is that uh, I think if you compare futures markets and open pricing to what happens when you get governments getting together and doing trades in commodities that aren't traded on exchanges, I think the latter gives you way more problems with corruption and illicit transfers and other problems than when you have open information on futures markets. It's a good question. Anything else? Okay, well, going we can... once, going twice, yeah. Yeah. sold. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you all very much uh, for this panel and all of the panels today. <laughs>